Tell me about when you had that spark in your eye and you were doing something new or playing with something new um, and talk about the technology that, that you developed or, or uh, brought to the world. So I started a company about four years ago now called, uh, called Tracker. It's a, it's a ser search engine to find experts, influencers, uh, people. We actually work East Week is one of our early clients. And when we first got the, the business going, um, we, we probably found you know, a few hundreds of people who tell us we're nuts. Um, and retrospectively, it was a great thing. And I think it's one of the things that got us going from the, from the beginning. And my co-founder and I really you know, had this, this passion for not so much the product itself that we had built, but more the vision that we had for what was coming. Um, and, and I think that's what got us going. And what you're talking about, the spark, I can recognize it in anyone I meet. And I know that they've been through the same path. And I know the ones who are gonna, uh, who have this same, uh, this same uh, drive. Was there a moment when, when you were playing with a piece of technology or, or building your business that you, you had that, you know, that, that passion or that, that spark in your eye where you, you recognize this is really cool? Or? Yeah, it was, it was for us, it was in the very early days when um, we threw something together. We knew it was kind of cool, but we didn't know what to do with it. And we started talking to potential users and people. And actually, Barbara from Eastwick is one of the first people we, we met soon after we, we launched a, a, a first release of, the, of that prototype. And just seeing how other people were actually driving our technology beyond what we had thought, to me, was a, was a critical moment to see that others and users were actually bringing more value. And there was so much more than what we had thought around it. And so it was sort of like a light bulb turning on. I was running a large product development group, um, network security for Cisco. So my job was to look at new technologies. Right? That's what I do all the time, and think about new things, and you know, incremental things, features, as well as kind of radical new things. And you know, there's tons of new stuff out there. Right? All, it's all around us. It's, it's, there's tons and tons of new ideas. So the question is, which one? Right? And, and I sort of have this general rule of thumb that, that you know, if you're going to start a new company, you, you, you have to have what I call the 10x. You got to be 10 times better than that which exists today. Not 20% better or 30% cheaper, like 10 times better. Um, and so, so uh, yeah, I just quit my job. Uh, I had a big office and the whole you know, telepresence units in my office and all that, and I quit um, because I think I have that 10x. Now, we don't have it. I think it's rare that you sort of are walking along and you sort of turn over a stone and like, oh, look at that. Here's the, the, the 10x. So you've got to kind of have the leap of faith that you're going to find the 10x, but you won't want to make it an, uh, you know, an uninformed jump. Uh, so I am right now in the process of, of um, hiring the first group of engineers, and we've written a little bit of prototype code, but we have not proven the 10x. When we do, uh, we will run like holy hell to take that thing to market and, and go. If we don't, we will pivot and keep looking for the 10x. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I agree 100% that 10x is, uh, is really a, a good, you know, benchmark because the reality is, is that you've got to have a lot of headroom. That is, if you can imagine a $50 million company, somebody who invests in you has to imagine a hundred million dollar company or a billion dollar company, what have you. And, uh, you know, for me, the, the spark that first happened was really in a dark computer lab playing games on a big computer. I mean, Steve Russell wrote a game called Space War in 1962, and I was in college. And, uh, and I worked, I happened to be that magic guy who worked at an amusement park summers. And so I said, if I had those computers here, I'd be in good shape. That's more than 10x. Well, the, <laughs> That's 100X. the, the problem is 100x <laughs> was the other way. Um, it was 25 cents a play, and it was a couple of million dollar computer. Right. So I said, hey, <laughs> that doesn't work. <laughs> and so you had to figure out a way to do it pretty cheap. Yeah. When you're building a company, you know, it, now that I'm inside a great company, I, I see what they did to get there and was great hiring. Tell me how you convinced great people to come and join you, because that's something that's really hard to do, especially in t today's world where it's hard to find an engineer on the street. <laughs> 
we had a corporate culture that we sort of stumbled on that really helped a lot, and that was that we hired our production workers who were all very young, 19, 20, 21, 22, and we had a party culture. It turns out that parties are, are a very powerful recruiting tool, and we found that we could almost hire anybody, particular geeks who most of them don't know a girl, um, and we had a lot of assembly workers that were pretty cool, and they would get to meet them at these parties, and we would hire them. How about it? You know, uh, th there's absolutely no question that a great company that needs three things. You know, you have to be in a space that makes sense, right? You know, it's very hard to start a company making toilet paper. Um, you have to have good technology um, uh, and access to capital. I kind of put them in the same bucket. But the difference between good companies and great companies is people. Um, so how do you find great people? Um, you know, my new company um, is already has 12 employees. So you know, our first round of financing is not done, done. But but the three board members we have are people that I've known for 15 years, and and. And that creates this kind of like nucleus of goodness. And it's an environment where you have super motivated, smart people, and people like to work with other smart people. And so it starts to build and grow and grow and grow. And, and some magic happens. My last company was called Ironport. And we had, I don't know, 400-ish employees when we got acquired by Cisco. And they were awesome, like every single person. But I didn't know them all. I didn't know how to acquire them all. You know, but you started that little seed, and it just kind of grows and it, and, it, and it spreads. And that's your, you know, your corporate culture is the, the thing that propagates um, and sustains that excellence. Yeah, so we're still very small. There are 15 of us right now. Um, and we, we've actually built for a small group a very strong culture in the company and a culture of empowerment. And what it means is that we have this nucleus uh, of people that feels empowered to deliver the work, feel very much that they're part of a, of a group, that they share the vision for the business, uh, but also feel responsible for hiring the next 15 and the next 15. So one, of, one small thing that we've implemented from very early on is that anyone from the most junior to the most senior person in the company has veto power on anyone else joining. So it just it drives a certain kind of people joining us. Um, and it's also helpful for the person arriving in the company to know that they will have that same veto power as they join. And it's, it's just one very small thing, but it's one of many where people need to understand that when they join us, that they're joining a small startup, and they're going from being an employee to being a partner it's in, into something bigger. And they need to share the vision, roll up their sleeve, and work. Yeah. Um, Steve Wozniak walked me through the Computer History Museum. And, and at each stage of going through that new exhibit, which is really great, if you haven't been there, you really should go see it you'd see a paradigm shift in the technology. And I think each of us have seen companies that have really taken advantage of real shifts in technology. How do you, how do you put yourself in play for the next paradigm shift? Because, you know, it, that's a tough one. Do you just have to be lucky in the right space at the right time? Or, or can you actually put yourself in play for those things? The question is, I mean, stuff's changing all around us. So what's a paradigm shift, right? Um, and, and that's why I use that kind of 10x filter. Right. And I, I, I was at Demo Chris, yes. Chris Shipley, uh, uh, last year. And you know, I, I've been to Demo a million times. And, and I, was, I, was, I was sitting in the audience. I was kind of listening. I'm like, these, a lot of these companies are like a feature. You know what I mean? It's not even like, not even like a product. It's like a, little, a, it's a knob on a product. And they're building a whole company around that. Um, so, so I think you've got to be really kind of hard-nosed about that. There, there, there's no shortage of interesting things to do. You know? But, uh, but you've got to pick the one that's going to result in something really, really big and meaningful. You know, in my opinion, one of the biggest ones hitting us right now is cloud. And I know it's very cliche. Oh my god, cloud. You know, I can't believe Tom's talking about cloud. And Apple already figured that out. But it's going to completely change the way computers work in the, in the corporation. Now that for paradigm well, shift, right? That's yeah. a big one. And, and I'm thinking now we're, we're in a world where starting and experimenting has gotten so cheap compared to where it used to be that you can actually try different things. Uh, and throw ideas out there and test them for real um, and try to see where that, where that gets you. So in, in some ways, I'd say that you, know, you have to be lucky, yes. At the same time, you, you have to be prepared to be lucky. So you know, sort of like you, we, we often think about uh, failure scenarios and, uh, and what happens if, uh, if something doesn't work out. But what happens if it actually works out a hundredfold? What it is you were thinking, you're ready for that as well. So that, I think that's, that's the mindset that I have 
where, where we're thinking and experimenting with our business. And when we strike a chord, we have to be ready to run with the ball. So it's a combination, I'd say, luck and process in some ways. Yeah. Paradigm shifts? I, I think that what you want to do is kind of focus on world needs and read science fiction. I actually think there's some hard work that you can do in predicting the future. You can look at, you know, what is the cost per bit of storage in 10 years? Well, there's a pretty predictable path there. And, and then you just look at things that are massively dysfunctional. And like my world right now is education. Education cannot continue the way it is. It doesn't work for kids today. And it's a $5 trillion marketplace. And uh, I've got some software that does easily the 10x. So bingo, I'm off and running. Nice. If you look at just the returns and innovation, the IT industry is this giant, wildly productive industry. Healthcare is kind of also cool, but definitely nowhere near that level of activity in, in computers. Education is almost none. Um, and you know, I, I have a thesis it's because of uh, you know, kind of the, the extent to which the free market runs. Like in, in the IT sector, it's almost completely unregulated. Right? Precisely. You build some crazy new computer. Oh my God! You put it in the cloud. No, it'll never work. It does. People want it. it Way we go. But you know, in education, is that a giant barrier that you guys are facing? Well, my job in the world is to look at giant barriers and figure out a way to knock them down. And an old drug dealer. Not, not the marijuana kind, <laughs> but uh, an old drug dealer said, you know, Pharmacist. first one's free. <laughs> and so a freemium model is a really good barrier dropper. Yeah. And right now, we have a two and a half cent customer acquisition cost because we give it away free. And uh, we're, in, we're in front of 60,000 kids right now, and we've not tried to do anything other than just do one email blast. Yeah to Spanish teachers, mm -hmm. teaching. And if you go into wordplay.com, you can play with some of our stuff that, that we're, we're alphaing. But what happens when you go free, it totally bypasses boards of, you know, school boards. Right. You don't have to ask per, permission. You don't have to ask permission. And so the teachers can use it as a supplemental tool. It's not just tech. It's a matter of, let's figure out how to get through the marketplace. We'll yeah, turn it into a marketplace, it. right? Or tune it, uh, yeah, or yeah. create a marketplace. Yeah. Yeah. Since we're at, we're at Eastwick's 20th uh, birthday, what's, what's the future of PR? Do we need PR to get to that marketplace today? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but not just that. <laughs> PR is the cheapest bang for a buck in the world. I mean, it is so powerful. Uh, and I think that... that uh, a, a, a proper PR program, I mean, it, it's just worth its weight in gold. It's, it's my primary tool. So yeah. if, you, if you're talking about paradigm shift, that's an industry that is right in the midst of one, right? And, and I'd say Eastwick is on the good side of it. Uh, and they were one, and, and Barbara specifically, and the agency behind her, uh, were very much on the forefront of the PR revolution. And we're seeing this today where you have tons of firms that are understanding how to do communication, and it's changed radically from just five years ago. Um, and we definitely need this. Today, uh, our uh, communication and PR is the only way we make money. So every single lead is actually coming through inbound. Every single lead is actually coming through uh, communications effort through social media and else. Yeah, PR in the broad sense, it's like, who you think you are and how you express that to the world. And um, it's, it's, it's as essential as your core technology. Right? Yeah. We've seen over and over again great technology that if people don't get it, um, never makes it off the shelf. <laughs>